For those of you uh, that aren't aware, I'm a CHP officer. And sometimes I get to do things in my job that I really enjoy. When I give a little uh, sticker, a uh, junior badge officer uh, to a little kid and their eyes light up and then they go, oh, fire truck, and throw it on the ground and take off. I love it when that happens. I love it when that happens. Or there's somebody broken down, especially when it's somebody from church and then I'm able to help them out, get them home, get them a tow truck or something. Uh, sometimes there's some things that I have to do that I don't necessarily enjoy. Uh, today was one of them. I was honored. It was a privilege. But on Monday, we lost another officer. And as such, uh, I was part of the protective services detail that transported the body from the morgue over to the mortuary, uh, where he'll be held until services on Monday. Um, along those lines, uh, this is the second officer in about three months that we've lost, and both of them are out of the Riverside office. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a moment and for Officer Moye, his family, um, and uh, the entire Riverside office, these, these guys are really hurting, and they need our prayers. So uh, let's just go ahead, and we'll start off tonight with praying for them. Dear precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, and uh, Lord, the uh, loss of Officer Moye is truly tragic. And Lord, there are so many that are in pain. There are so many that are suffering right now. And Lord, I just pray that you would lift each and every one of them up. Lord, that you would wrap your loving arms around every officer that is struggling, every officer that feels the pain and the sting of death, every officer that has to continue to go out and do their job, even though they've lost a good friend, a fellow worker, and Lord, a saint. So God, I just pray that you would be with his family. Lord, comfort them in this time of loss. I pray that you would be with the entire office. And Lord, the... Uh, every law enforcement officer that puts their life on the line. Uh, there's a little bit of us that gets lost each time uh, we lose one of our fellow workers. So precious Heavenly Father, I pray that you would be with them, be their strength, and know how much that we still love and put our trust and faith in you. You can use even bad things for good. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So tonight, let me ask you this. Is there anybody here who likes looking in their rearview mirror and seeing the red light from a black and white? It's okay, one, one, excellent. <laughs> so one of my good friends, um, he is part of our advanced officer safety training, AOST. And with it, one of the things that they do is they run a bunch of scenarios. And one of the scenarios are called speed stops. So basically, we have our role player that's sitting there as the violator, and the officers would walk up and they'd say, you know, sir, I stopped you for your speed. Can I see your license, registration, proof of insurance? Now, the response is, oh, I'm really sorry, officer. Um, you know, I just wasn't paying attention to my speed. I'm just trying to get home. Um, I promise I'll go ahead and slow down. And then that officer is to act appropriately. Sir, please give me your license, registration, and everything. And sometime throughout that stop, things go terribly wrong. The violator grabs a gun, points it at the officer, and we continue with the scenario. Well, my buddy was coming back from, from uh, uh, Sacramento up at our academy, and he looks in his rear view mirror, and what does he see? He sees the red light. He looks down at his speed, and he's like, oh, man. <laughs> so... He pulls over, the officer walks up, and the officer says, I stopped you for your speed. Can I see your license, registration, proof of insurance? And what does he say? He says, I'm really sorry, officer. I wasn't paying attention to my speed. I didn't realize I was going that fast. I'll go ahead and I'll slow down. And instantly he realized, without even realizing it, what he had just said, and he was like, oh God, please let this officer have not gone through our class, because otherwise I'm about to get shot. <laughs> Fortunately then, he very quickly ID'd himself, and he's like, hey, hey, uh, I'm an officer, California Highway Patrol, I'm one of you guys, and the guy was like, oh, way out of us, you know. It went okay, he didn't get shot, which is a good thing. However, the title of tonight's message is Submit to Government, Love Your Neighbor, and Put on Christ. So, 
along those lines and looking at that submission to government, when we see that red light, we don't necessarily like it, okay? However, however, it is something that we are called to do. It's something that God's word says that we're supposed to do, whether we like it or not. Now, as you look at that title, it almost sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it, right? Submit to government and love your neighbor. Well, what if my neighbor is a state senator? What if my neighbor um, is a Democrat? Okay, by the way, no Democrats were harmed in the making of this message, okay? Um, what if my, my neighbor were Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, or even our very own Kamala Harris? Adam, we're supposed to submit to and love them? How are we supposed to do that? Well, the answer's in the title. We put on Christ. This is one of my favorite chapters in the book of Romans. We're going to be taking a look at Romans 13, if you'd open up your Bibles there. Also, is there anybody here who needs a Bible? Anyone? Okay, uh, ushers will come around to get you your Bible. And again, uh, you know, it is so important for us to be in God's Word and to actually read it. Don't trust the person standing up here in the pulpit, okay? Be a Berean. Find out for yourself. When I put down these passages, look at these passages and see, oh, okay, yeah, okay, Adam's not just making this stuff up. Because I can sit here and I can quote to you all different kinds of scripture. Romans 13, 4. And this is one of the reasons why this is one of my favorite scriptures. For he, meaning the officer or the soldier, is God's minister for you to do good. However, if you do evil, be afraid. For he is also God's avenger to execute wrath. You see, I can go ahead and just quote that to you. But what if I'm misquoting it? What if I'm doing like it says in Matthew, when here it was, Jesus was out in the desert with, uh, with, uh, with Satan, right? What did Satan do? He quoted scripture, didn't he? Ah, but he left little words out here and there. He changed things up just a little bit. So, should you love this man behind the pulpit? Yes. <laughs> but verify, trust but verify in the words of our, uh, uh, one of our amazing presidents, Ronald Reagan. Trust but verify. So, now, why is chapter 13 one of my favorite chapters? Well, is it because I'm a police officer and it's God telling you, submit to my authority? Well, maybe. <laughs> is it because we are afraid uh, of those who bear the sword and I have many swords? Maybe. Or is it because God challenged us here to do the right thing even when we necessarily don't want to? Yes. You see, we're called to do hard things, folks. We're called to do them from the very beginning of time. When Adam screwed things up for us, <laughs> what was the curse? In Genesis 3.17, it says, Then at, to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat all, eat of it all the days of your life. You see, nowhere in God's word will you find that we're supposed to go ahead and be laying in a hammock, having, you know, uh, our significant others wave a palm frond at us and feed us grapes, okay? And our kids telling us that we're wonderful every time, right? No, right? But what does it say here? Right here in Genesis, from the very beginning, it says, it says, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. It doesn't say just some. It doesn't say in the beginning. It says all. And in the Greek, what does all mean? Thank you. You guys are good. But notice it also says, God says, for your sake. You see, he knows what's best for us. He, God knows what each and every one of us needs. And what we need is more Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 So, Chapter 12 ends with verse 21, which says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, was Paul saying here that, uh, um, that if somebody threatens our lives or threatens our, uh, the lives of our, our significant others, our, our family, or our property, that we don't have a right to protect ourselves? Well, open up in Matthew to Matthew 24, verse 43. Matthew 24, verse 43. 
And in Matthew 24, 43, it says, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Ah. So here, Jesus specifically says that we have every right to go ahead and to protect our loved ones and our property. But, ooh, what if it's the police? What if it's our government that comes knocking on your door, says, I have a warrant for your arrest? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. So, verse, uh, chapter 13 in Romans, verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. President Clinton was appointed by God? Yep. Obama, appointed by God? Yep. Trump, appointed by God? Yes. And I love it because uh, not too long ago, Sarah Huckabee Sanders said, God wanted Donald Trump to be president. Maybe she was reading Romans 13 that morning. What do you think? <laughs> Yes, yes, they were placed there by God. Now, let's think about this for a minute. How many times prior to Trump's run in 2016 did he say he was going to run for president? A whole bunch, right? He threatened that he was going to run for president because there weren't a, a worthy enough candidates. Again and again and again. But with the past presidents that we've had, both Republican and Democrats, I believe it created the atmosphere for Donald Trump to go ahead and become elected. Now, why does God then allow evil men to reign if God is the one who establishes it? Hmm. Basically, because men want evil men to reign over them. And God will allow those evil rulers to lead the people in order that they might receive that rightful judgment of God. Think about in the book of Kings, right? I remember the first time when I was reading through the Bible, and here it is, I got to the book of Kings. And I'd start reading about the first king, and then all of a sudden, bam! Evil king, right? And then I'd start reading about the second one, and bam! evil king again. And I'm like, oh man, weren't there any, didn't Israel have any good kings? And then suddenly one started to do right by the word of God. And then bam, evil. I, it, it got depressing. I was like, come on, Lord. These are people that are established by you. Can't we have at least one good king in the mix somewhere? Right? But you know, then God kind of opened up my eyes a little bit. And he said to me, he said, Look at your own imperfect life. Ooh. How many times did you sin against me? But you were still a child of mine, and I still loved you. You're right, Lord. You're right. But I'm told here that as a child of God, we are to be subject to those in higher powers because they have been established and been there and put there by God. But Adam... What if the government laws contradict God's law? Who? Turn with me to Acts chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. Acts chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. And in Acts 4, 19, it says, But Peter answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. You see, they were being told by the authorities to go ahead and keep quiet. But they chose to listen to God. Mark 8.36 states, For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And to quote, God's not dead too, I would rather stand with God and be judged by the world than to stand with the world and be judged by God. Now, that being said, the Bible does not allow for civil disobedience. What? Wait, wait a second. So you're saying that we can't protest? 
We can't run around like Antifa and beat the snot out of journalists for our cause. Oh, Christ loves you so much. No, we can't. What does it say in verse 1? It says, let every soul be subject. Right? Not some, but all. And what does all in Greek mean? Oh, yes. Remember, Paul was writing this when Nero was ruling Rome. That was from 54 AD to 68 AD. The same Nero that burnt Rome down for his entertainment, for his own amusement, and then blamed it on the Christians, using them as a scapegoat. He would round them up and persecute them, place them into the arena. He'd put animal hides onto the back of them and then sick dogs in order to maul them to death. They were set on fire and used as evening lights in Nero's yard for his evening barbecues. Yet Paul still writes and says that we are to be subject to the authorities. Hmm. You know, I read a commentary by Pastor Chuck Smith, and he put it this way. It should be kept in mind that Paul himself was a lawbreaker. He disobeyed the government. However, Paul followed his own teachings here by being submissive to that same government. He eventually paid for his crimes against the state with his life as did many of the other apostles. Paul does not choose this passage to address a need to break the law of men when they stand against God's direct commands to us. Instead, Paul makes it clear that in the normal course of life, human authorities instituted by God carry out God's will by punishing people who do what is wrong. Christians, in that sense, should submit to those in authority, doing good in all cases and obeying the laws that are not a violation of Christian conscience. Do you want to know how we can go ahead and as Christians display civil disobedience? Vote. <laughs> Vote. You know, I'm one that keeps abreast of uh, political policies, right? I watch my news. I'm on the websites and everything along those lines. And it always fascinates me when I hear somebody complaining about this great nation or about our government. And then I ask them, have you voted? And they usually say, no. Well, my vote's not going to count, right? Why should I do this anyway? It's all corrupt anyway. The Russians are just going to stuff the ballot boxes. There was an investigation about that. <laughs> we should not be the silent majority, but instead proclaiming the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and, as Savior all the way to the ballot box. Can I get an amen? amen. Thank you. Verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists the ordinances of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Now, Paul isn't necessarily speaking of eternal judgment, but God may judge people through the use of human authorities he anoints. Judgment and using the authorities. Received a call of a collision on the 215 over by the Shandon Hills Golf Club, uh, golf course over there. One of the vehicles had overturned, another one had sent into the other lanes, and uh, one of the, uh, there was a couple that fleed. They took leg bail, they ran across the freeway, and jumped over a property fence. Um, a couple of golfers happened to see them and what they were doing, and they took out their nine irons, and they were like, you better get back over there. <laughs> so, Reluctantly, they came back to the scene, and amazingly, they were injured. They were hurt, and so when the fire department got there, they loaded them up on stretchers and put them into the back of the ambulance, and off to the hospital they went. So, needing to get statements and more information, I responded down to the, the hospital. I asked them their names, uh, you know, IDs for all of that good stuff. They gave me the information. They didn't have any IDs on them. And then one of the ambulance drivers calls me over and he says, hey, he goes, while we were transporting them, the guy says to the girl, hey, don't talk to the cops at all. Tell them that we were being chased by this black guy who brandished a gun at us, and that's the reason why we had to go ahead and, and got cut off. Interesting. Thank you very much. 
So I ran him, and the description came back close to the individual that I was dealing with. And any time I went to go to talk to the female, he was immediately, don't talk to him. Don't say anything. Okay. Well, he gets wheeled out to go to uh, get x-rayed. So I go up to the young lady, and I'm like, hey, look, here's the deal. I don't know whether the other people involved in this collision are going to make it or not. You could be, 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 get charged with manslaughter. Is that something that you want on your record? No, and she started to break down, and, and I said, all right, then you need to start being honest with me right now. I already know that the story that you told me was bogus. So, what's his real name? William Bonnet, which kind of cracked me up, right? Billy the Kid. So, I run that name now. Suddenly, he comes back with a $200,000 warrant out of uh, Oregon. And you know what happened? He had gotten into a chase with the police. He had crashed. The fire department went ahead and transported him. And as soon as he got to the hospital, he took off. He fled. So, now knowing this information, I call up my sergeant and I'm all, hey, I got a flight risk that's here. I want to handcuff him to the gurney. Are you good with that? And so he was like, yeah, but just to be on the safe side, go ahead and check with the, uh, the doctor and make sure that it's okay. So doc comes in. I explained to her what was going on. And she goes, you know, she goes, I, I understand where you're coming from, but if we need to do anything medically with him, then we'll have to try to come and find you and you'll have to get your key out and everything. Would you be okay if we put him in leg and arm restraints? I'm like, that's even better. <laughs> It'll be even more uncomfortable. No, I'm good with that, Doc. Yeah, go for it. So they come in, they wheel him back in from x-rays, and, uh, and as, the, as they're strapping him down, I'm like, okay, sir, so just making sure your name is Jim Smith, and uh, this was your statement, and everything that you told me was true and correct. Is that, is that correct? Yes, it is. Zip! <laughs> they, they wrench him down, and I'm like, all right, Mr. Bonnet, since you have a $200,000 warrant, and you just lied and impeded my, you know, three felonies on top of this, potentially manslaughter as well, you're being placed under arrest. So he gets left there all night, stuck down to the gurney, right? So the next day I go to pick him up to bring him to jail. We get him down to the jail and they start asking him the medical questions. Hey, have you, are you hearing voices? Do you feel like hurting yourself or committing suicide? He says, yes. So the jailer says, well, why? And he said, well, I've just been having some really bad luck lately. Okay, you know what happens? He gets placed on suicide watch. For the next 48 hours, he gets stripped of all of his clothes and zip, <laughs> strapped down to a canoe in the middle of a jail cell. I believe that God used me to bring judgment upon William. What do you think? <laughs> so sometimes God can use us for things like that. All right, verse three. For rulers are not a terror to do good work, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praises from the same. You know, it's funny because we get, we hear about all of these shootings and everything like that, you know, in the news. And, you know, and all of these people, you know, literally riots have broken out over individuals that were improperly treated uh, now, of course, is it, is, let, let me be, let me, let me preface this, okay? Is there a certain amount of bias because I'm a police officer? Well, yes, <laughs> okay, I'll be honest with you. And, you know, just as uh, there are good Starbucks employees and there are bad Starbucks employees, I've gotten good cups of coffee and really terrible cups of coffee, okay? However, are there good officers and are there bad officers? Yeah, there are, okay? But I would have to say, I'll go out on a limb here, 95% of them out there are good officers. Are there that 5%? Yes, there are, okay? However, if you just obey whatever it is that the officer's telling you to do, you know what's gonna happen? Exactly, <laughs> absolutely nothing. You might receive a citation, and you know what? By all means, take it to court, okay? Fight it, fight that officer if you feel that you've been given that citation wrong. I know, none of you in here speed. 
so fight it, you know? Plus it's usually overtime for the officers, so that's always a good thing too, right? But it always cracks me up, these people that think that, that I can go ahead, I can yell and scream at this officer, I don't have to obey him, you know what? Uh, or the sovereign citizens, those are my favorite, right? Oh, well this car is my country and I proclaim this my country and as such as my country, you're invading and I have every right to go ahead and defend myself. Yeah, you see that tow truck? It's picking up your car. Do you want to get out now? <laughs> you and your whole country, okay? But, you see, it's simple. Obey what the authorities are saying, even if you don't necessarily agree. You'll have the opportunity to go ahead and plead your case in the courts. That's what our justice system is about, okay? Um, do the right thing. Do what is good, and you will be receive the praise of the same. Verse 4. For he is God's minister for you to do good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So first off, when we look at this, who is he? Well, that's the ruler. That's the guardian of order and the preserver of peace. It would, be a, it would have been the soldier of Paul's time. It would have been the peace officer of ours. They are there as a blessing. But if you do something wrong, what does it say? They are also God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath. Now that's kind of cool. So I'm kind of like Iron Man or Thor. Okay. I was expecting a hammer to come and, you know, immediately. I guess I'm only worthy. I'm not worthy. Michael, there we go. <laughs> um, so, um, with that, okay, now, uh, now, let's go ahead and look at, look at it through this perspective. I'm a godly man. I'm also a peace officer. I often use my platform in order to reach others. I have an opportunity to witness to them. Um, I've said it before, sometimes I have a very captive audience. <laughs> Now, but what about those that aren't walking with the Lord? Hmm, yes. Even those officers, those that are in authority, who don't think themselves to be agents of God, God still uses them. Verse 5. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. So, we must obey our government. Not only is it our civic duty, but it's our spiritual duty before God. Verse 6. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continuously to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor pay your taxes. Pay them for the services that you receive. Now, for example, recently we voted on a gas tax, right? And here it is for 25 cents, it went up at the, at the uh, gas pumps per gallon. And personally, I am so pleased because now there isn't any more congestion on the freeway. Uh, there's no more potholes. There's two lanes down the 330 continuously. And I don't have to stop for the five guys that are working on a bridge forever. <laughs> anyway, I, I always find it interesting. We're to pay our taxes, right? We're to, we're to go ahead and do this. Now, a lot of people don't know, but the California Highway Patrol, they are funded, not by taxes, but every time that you register your car, okay? One dollar goes into our fund. Okay? And that's how the highway patrol is funded. So it always cracks me up when I get somebody who's just a little bit disgruntled, just a little bit upset that Officer Friendly has gone ahead and stopped him and pulled him over onto the side of the road. And he's like, don't you have anything better to do? I pay taxes. I pay your salary. I used to have a good friend of mine that would always look at him and go, you want your buck back? They never knew what he was talking about, <laughs> but I loved it. Pay your taxes, pay your taxes. In Mark 12, 13, it says, then 
they sent him uh, some Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, uh, and care, care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes for Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, Jesus, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I might see. So they brought it. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. Now, there was a, uh, um, a pastor, and his name was Dr. Hoven. Uh, also had the nickname Dr. Dino, right? Amazing, amazing individual. And he would talk about the flood and the story of creation and everything. And uh, just how uh, it, was, it was very much a, a, a new earth um, uh, uh, theme. Uh, yes, right? And, uh, and that's what he preached. And it was amazing. I saw him over at, over at uh, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa intelligent, smart guy, previous science teacher, right? And like I said, real, real smart guy and was able to use parts of the Bible in order to substantiate some of science and vice versa. Amazing individual. However, he also said that our income tax and the way that it was written by our government, uh, for example, the words every time when it was written up that they were going to start with the income tax, the words United States of America were not capitalized. And he said they did that on purpose because they knew that the tax was illegal. It was something that was not voted on by the public. And as such, we did not have to pay them. It was an illegal tax. That's what he believed throughout his research and wholeheartedly. He also spent time in jail for not <laughs> paying his taxes and for tax evasion. So when we read in here in God's word where it says... Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Pay your taxes. Okay? <laughs> Bottom line. Pay your taxes. Verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. And if is... If there is any other commandments, all are summed up in this. Namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is a fulfillment of the law. It says, owe no one anything. Does that mean that we can't borrow? We have to save up for our $250,000 house? Turn with me to Psalms 37, 21. Psalms 37, 21. And in Psalms 37, 21, it says, the wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. You see, the wicked doesn't repay. You know, there's a commercial on, uh, on AM590, and it talks about your credit debt. And it's funny because it always upsets me because they get on there and they say, you may not have to pay back the money you owe. <laughs> Do we see a problem there? Is, is there a problem when you go ahead and say that, right? Now, do some of the credit card companies go ahead and gouge their customers? Yes, okay. But these individuals signed and agreed to pay 21% or more on their credit cards. Yes, okay. You see, Matthew 5, 42 says, give to him who asks you and uh, from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. So, is debt good? No. Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is a servant to the lender. Now, is there good debt and bad debt? Yes. Mortgage? Good. 
gives you a house to live in, right? While you're paying that off. Credit card with 21% interest, bad, right? But Paul is also speaking of love. You see, love is a debt that is never really paid in full. Why did Jesus go to the cross? It wasn't because he thought it was going to be fun and exciting. Quite the opposite, right? I mean, here it was. He was so afraid of being separated from God that he sweat blood. He went because of love. John 3, 16. For God loves, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I love how Paul breaks out some of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. And Jesus sums it up in Mark 12, 30 and 31. And in Mark 12, 30 and 31, it says, And you shall love your Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like this, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And you see, I think way too many people, they misconstrue the New Testament and think that the Old Testament doesn't apply anymore. Now, let me attempt to give you this analogy. Let's say that you were to refinance your house. And instead of paying the old $1,400 uh, a month uh, payment, you now only had to pay $1,000. Now, are you bound to pay that $1,400? No, right? But would it still be a good idea? Yes, because now you're paying down the principal towards your mortgage and you'll get out of debt faster. And that's a good thing, as we just discussed. So, you see, this isn't just a nice scriptural message. Now we've incorporated Finance 101 into this as well. See, God's word does not return void, does it? <laughs> so, if we were to look at any of the Ten Commandments, they would basically fall under the two that Jesus just said. Uh, it states it there in Mark. Paul sums it up by saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore, love is a fulfillment of the law. Verse 11. And do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Are we living like that? Or is tomorrow just going to be another day that we get up and go to work? Is Sunday just going to be another day that we go ahead and go to church? See, all the prophecy for Jesus to come back, all, everything that is necessary has already been fill, fulfilled. So let us li live our lives like time is short, because it is. Verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. And I like this. Let us put on the armor of light. When you look at a soldier, he's got a helmet. He's got a weapon. He's got an armored vest, right? Right? But is he always wearing his gear 24-7? No, right? No, he's doing it when he's going to prepare for battle. He puts it on when he's getting ready to battle. Guess what? We need to battle daily. Daily. We need to put on our spiritual armor each and every day. Just as it says in Ephesians 10 through 13. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness, armor of light of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Are you ready for battle? Are you ready for battle? Yeah. Are we ready for battle? Yeah. Yes! Romans 13, 13. 
let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelries and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Make no provision. Do not provide a way. If you're alone when you stumble, don't be alone. If you're on the computer when you stumble, put in blocks and passwords. Take your laptop and use it in a public place. If it's a TV that makes you stumble, change the channel. Better yet, turn it off and read God's word. Or a good book like The Master Plan of Evangelism on sale now out in the foyer. <laughs> Don't give in to the enemy. Remember, he's looking for every opportunity to go ahead and take us down. Ever since you went ahead and said, I am a Christian, you gave your life to Christ, what did you do? You took a giant target, that's right, a bullseye right on you. And the devil is constantly going around looking for you. How do I know? Because look at 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfastly in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So, as we wrap up, yes, Adam, I want to be vigilant. I want to be ready for battle. But how? Number one. Find an encourager. Find an accountability partner. Here it is, David had Jonathan. And during our men's camp out, that was something that we discussed. The importance to have that partner, that person that, hey, you can call them up and go, brother, I am struggling. I am hurting right now. I need some prayer. That person that you can go ahead and you can share the deepest, darkest secrets of your heart. That person that you can, will come alongside of you and say, hey, brother, God's got this. That encourager, that no matter where you go, you know that you can put your faith and trust in them. Okay? Find that person. It's so important to have that. You know, way too often today, we have that lone wolf mentality and society puts it out there. Be a self-made man. Go ahead. You can do that, right? Hey, you don't have to stay at home with the children. You can be a professional woman. You can have it all, right? But have that partner, somebody that you can go to, somebody that when you're really feeling lousy, they're going to pick you up. Find that Jonathan. Number two, the Bible. Be in his word. Be in his word. Carry his sword with you. I know individuals that bring their Bibles to the gym. They work out. They'll break open the book, read some scripture, Go pump some iron, come back, read scripture again and everything along those lines. You know, and, and I have to admit, uh, I was talking to this individual and he was like, yeah, Adam, I have to admit, you know, I mean, at first I was kind of afraid to do that. You know, I was kind of like, ooh, people think I'm, you know, I'm a little bit weird, a little bit crazy, you know, in order to do that. But then people started coming up to him. Hey, are you a Christian? Yeah, yeah. Brother, that's so encouraging. That's so encouraging. I never even thought of that, you know. I need to be in God's word too. Yeah, all the time. So he was out there. He was doing it. He was in God's word. And bring that. Bring that sword with you everywhere you go. And number three, be in prayer. Be in prayer. It's the most powerful weapon we have in our armory. Paul encourages us. He says it in Romans 12.12. 12, Rejoice in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. And also, again, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, it says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ in you. Pray without ceasing. Do we do that? I know so many times I'll get into a difficult situation. I'll have, be having a hard day and everything. And you know, usually that's the last thing that I do when I've I've exhausted everything else. I've gone ahead. I've had my comfort food, <laughs> right? You know, everything else in order to make me feel a little bit better after a lousy day. And then they're kind of like, oh, that's right, Lord. Should have gone to you first. And it doesn't need to be these huge prayers. 
I mean, we can do them in our cars. We can do them driving to work. We can do them at a stoplight. I heard it once said that we spend something, it's something amazing, like, like uh, two and a half years just waiting at stoplights throughout our life. Two and a half years. Now, what if you said, I prayed for two and a half years straight. Would that be amazing? Truly amazing? So I encourage you, do some red light prayers. Because we should pray without ceasing. Folks, we're to submit to government. Even if it's somebody that we don't like who's in power. Folks, we need to love our neighbor. Even if we don't necessarily like him. Remember, we need to love him, not like him. Lastly, we're to put on Christ. Especially if we're dealing with someone we don't like. In all seriousness, prepare for that battle daily. Because it's not if the enemy will come. It's when. It's when. Would you pray with me? Our precious Heavenly Father. Lord, I just said it. The most powerful thing we can do is we can pray. We can lift up our prayers to you. And Lord, uh, just as I mentioned on Sunday, Lord, it, it, we have iniquity in our hearts. These things can fall on deaf ears. Our prayers can fall on deaf ears. But Lord, I pray that you would forgive us because we are sinful men. Dear God, hear our prayers. Lord, know how much we love you, how much we thank you, how much we appreciate all the many blessings that you give us each and every day. And precious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray, if there was anything here of man that was said and spoken tonight, I pray that it fall on deaf ears. But Lord, if here it was, it was from you, your spirit led. I pray, Jesus, that you'd etch it upon our hearts. You know how much we love you, how much we thank you. We sing your praises. To you be all the glory and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen.